Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us in our continuing series of webinars about National History Day 2020, Breaking Barriers in History. I'm Ellen Dornan. I'm the state coordinator for National History Day in New Mexico. And today I am so pleased to be joined by Dr. Amy Slaughter, who is the museum educator at the Los Alamos History Museum. Um, many of you may know her as an NHD judge. And um, Amy comes to us with a tremendous amount of knowledge on the topic of breaking barriers in nuclear science. Uh, she has a doctorate from in the history of science, technology, and medicine from the University of Minnesota. And so um, welcome, Amy, much for joining us today from Los Alamos. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I, I know that your your expertise is much broader, but can we start out sort of talking about breaking barriers in uh, what most people associate with Los Alamos around the Manhattan Project? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, students that are interested in doing projects on the Manhattan Project, on the Trinity Test, on the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I think that there's, there's such a broad, project on such a broad topic that um, I would really encourage students to focus in, like pick what barriers you are thinking about in this project. Like, are you looking at scientific frontiers? Are you looking at military frontiers? Like what barriers were being broken? What was it that was barring the way? And then what were the consequences of those broken barriers? And there's so many different levels and so many different things that you can focus on that. Um, looking at the context of the Manhattan Project is important also. So whatever that specific topic that you're looking at, if you're looking at the science, what was the context of that physics at the time or that chemistry at the time? If you're looking at the military, like what was the context of World War II? And then specifically, what was the context of the, the arena that you're looking at in that? Um, and what was unique about that context or what was routine about that context. And then a, another challenge looking at the Manhattan Project and looking at something that is as big as the Manhattan Project um, is focusing on actors. So that's a term that like historians will use, academics will use to just mean people. So like people that are making decisions, people that are taking action are actors. And I think that when you're looking at a project that's as um, looking at an NHD project that's as broad as I want to do something on the Manhattan Project, it's really easy to end up saying things like the Manhattan Project did this or the government did that. Um, and I would really challenge students to look at like what individual people, what teams of people, like who was it that was actually doing this work or who was it that was actually, you know, making this decision, who had power, who didn't have power, who was at the table making the decisions, who wasn't at that table, and who worked together, and did they work together well, or did they not work together well? Um, and that's how, you know, if you're sitting down, you're like, oh, okay, I wanna do the Manhattan Project, something for, for NHD, because the atomic bomb was this like huge, like it defined an era. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know yet, where you want to focus in on that, start trying to look at what people were involved and then maybe your curiosity will lead you to, oh, I'm actually interested in minorities who worked on the Manhattan Project. I'm actually interested in young scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project, or I'm actually interested in the military history. And wherever those people stories are, I think then you can follow that and get a more focused um, NHD project, which is something that judges are always excited to see. Well, um, one of the, things I was thinking about just in terms of barriers in the Manhattan Project, and I think your, your point about choosing a, choosing a barrier to look at yeah. is really important. Um, but I know specifically with the Manhattan Project, one of the barriers was that secrecy around the project. And so you had people who were breaking those barriers by spying, right. by transferring that information, but you also had people who were breaking just the physical fence barriers just because they could. Yeah, yeah, so you can look at that security aspect um, just in terms of the barriers that were put in place for people who lived in places like Los Alamos. You had to live with these security restrictions. You had to 
lie to your family and friends that you left behind about where you were going and what you were doing because you couldn't tell them because the army prevented you from telling them. But then, like you said, there's also the other side of like literally breaking that barrier of like going through that fence and passing information as a spy, knowing that you weren't allowed to spy. So there were three spies that were here in Los Alamos uh, during the Manhattan Project. All of them uh, were providing information to the Soviet Union, uh, which is interesting because they were an ally of the United States during World War II, but they were not part of the Manhattan Project and weren't in on the secret. So it was providing information to an ally, but also not in on the secret. So that's, it, it wasn't quite the same as if they were spying for Germany, but they were <laughs> providing information. Um, the best place of those uh, three spies um, was uh, Klaus Fuchs. Uh, he was somebody who was from Germany and then was a British citizen and was, uh, was here. Um, and the all, the all three spies had different motivations uh, for spying, but core to a lot of their thinking of wanting to provide information to the Soviet Union. Um, they were sympathetic with communism, but they were also imagining what the world would look like if there was one nuclear superpower. And no matter how well-intentioned that one country is, they get to call the shots. If there's only one country that has an atomic bomb, like global geopolitics, like they get to do whatever they want. So they were hoping, the spies were hoping by providing information to the Soviet Union to sort of balance those scales a little bit. Um, I, I don't know. I, I would love to see an NHD project looking in, into that and also looking a little bit to like, how did those spies react then seeing the Cold War develop the way that it did? That they broke right. these barriers, but then what were the consequences? Uh, the very young one, Ted, what was his, his uh, name? Hall. Ted Hall, Theodore Hall. Um, he spoke about this, and I know that this video is out there and available, but he spoke about it late in life and basically said that he had no regrets, that he felt like the world was better off with a balance of power. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in doing research on espionage in our archives at the Los Alamos Historical Society, we don't have anything that's directly related to the espionage, but we have all sorts of documents related to the security. So you can come in and see letters that have been, um, you know, marked out by the censors and you can see the restrictions that like oh. the rules that you knew that you had to follow while you were here. So you could get a sense of what those barriers were in our archives. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's really interesting. Um, but you know, you mentioned that Klaus Fuchs came from Germany. I guess that's another kind of barrier is the immigrants, immigrant scientists who came to America during that time and were drafted into working on the Manhattan Project. Yeah, yeah, volunteered to work on the Manhattan Project. There were there was a sizable community of refugee scientists who lived here uh, in the Manhattan Project. Um, and that was, that fleeing fascist Europe was something that, and coming to America was something that was available to prominent scientists, but wasn't available to all refugees that were trying to flee fascist Europe. Um, so that's that's another barrier that is that is interesting because there was both there was a barrier to entry and there were people who wanted to flee to America that couldn't. But if you were a really well placed nuclear physicist, you know, please come and work on the Manhattan Project, basically. But yeah. Um, so what about I mean some of the science with the Manhattan Project? I know that one of the things that people are looking at is with breaking barriers is the first. And so clearly we have a first there, but right. um, what, you know, when you're breaking down um, the significance of something like the Trinity test or uh, dropping a bomb on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I mean, where do you see those barriers um, scientifically? Yeah. It's, Human it's, costs aside. <laughs> right. It's, they're, they, they're interesting scientific barriers. It's also really an engineering problem. Um, the, the creation of the atomic bomb, again, human cost aside for the moment. Um, a lot of times the Manhattan Project gets framed as this um, like scientific breakthrough and there were scientific breakthroughs that were involved with it, but it was also like a lot of engineering that was happening. There was a lot of like practical creating something 
designing a weapon around this is how big the bomb bay is and this is we're going to work backwards from that because it's no use to us if we can't physically get it into the plane um, and the engineers don't get paid attention to really the same way because physicists have, have dominated the the popular narrative so looking you know doing an nhd project and looking at the engineering looking at the metallurgy looking at these sciences that kind of don't get the same attention that the physicists get I, that could be interesting too because there were a lot of breakthroughs in metallurgy and chemistry and all sorts of like military engineering so logistics and that um just figuring out how the trigger mechanism was going to work right i mean yeah. that wasn't that a big part of the the process was making sure it wasn't going to blow up too right. soon or too late <laughs> yeah. yeah um so um when you get into talking about, I mean, since we set aside the human cost for a moment, but, you know, obviously the difference between, say, the Trinity tests, well, it uh, maybe wasn't such a difference. And a lot of the scientists did end up with cancer on radiation exposure. And so, you know, um, sort of how would you frame that? Uh, the right. impact. Yeah, I mean, so so the the use of the atomic bomb in tests and on two cities like that is that is a huge barrier that was broken. That had never been happened before. This was a brand new weapon. It meant new things for war, and it meant new things uh, in terms of the human cost uh, because unlike firebombing, which you could compare like in the same era in the same war, there there are the long-term effects of radiation poison, poisoning and cancers. Um, so you could look at that effect as well. And one you know, angle that you could look at that is looking at, the, again, the consequences of breaking that barrier and how does that inform, um, for example, peace movements today, nuclear non-proliferation movements, um, activists that are trying to make sure that there aren't any more nuclear weapons or that they're never used again. Um, and they have that that barrier that was broken. And now people looking back at that and saying, this is a barrier that should be in place, that we shouldn't use these weapons anymore. So that's another way of, because I, I think the first thing that occurs to me thinking about the the, um, the topic breaking barriers is like, oh, okay, pioneers, like trailblazers, but I, there are some barriers that, that should be there. <laughs> Right. That, that, that could be an interesting way to, to look at the topic. Well, and I think, um, you know, the way the radiation can contaminate or um, poison, you know, people or living beings or the environment uh, is sort of an example of a physical, the physical barriers yeah. being broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, was that known at the time? I mean, were those impacts really uh, acknowledged before deployment of the weapons? Yes, um, the, the full effects weren't known because that weapon had never been dropped before, mm -hmm. but radiation poisoning uh, and uh, uh, ionizing radiation causing cancers was known. Um, from the discovery of radium, which had happened at the beginning of the century. Um, early researchers into that um, had gotten ill from that. Um, people who were uh, treated with uh, radioactive medicines, um, depending on the dosage, uh, had, had been ill. So it, it was known. Um, the full effects, the full details weren't, um, but it was not like a, an unexpected side effect of the weapons. I'm, I'm sort of curious about how some of that came into play. I mean, this is maybe a, a little bit outside, outside the Manhattan Project Bailiwick, but just looking at the era of nuclear testing in the 1950s, like in mm -hmm. the Bikini Atoll or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was all known that it was going to cause this yeah. environmental ca catastrophe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the people of the Marshall Islands are still living with the legacies of that testing. Um, people who live in areas um, in the former Soviet Union uh, where testing was happening there, that still has had an effect on communities and the environment there. Um, so that's, that's another... Not to mention St. George, Utah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and, and downwinders uh, of tests in the United States as well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, it 
that, that is worth pointing out because it, it is, uh, I think, easy to think about like, oh, okay, this is this is the beginning of the atomic age, and then tests were happening, but it's sort of this thing that we can show on charts and graphs. But there were people involved with those tests also in a lot of different ways. Right, right. Um, no, I'm, I, I don't think I've ever seen a project on the downwinders, on yeah. any downwinders, so. Um. That, would, that would be really, and it, you can get into like geographical barriers in that too, because you can look at like actual maps of like, here's where we, you know, here's where the government thinks mm -hmm. uh, the radiation, you know, will go. Here's where the cloud we think will go. It's where it's projected to go. And you can look at that and then look at where there are communities and see right. how well the maps match with reality. It's the, the atomic tests in Nevada weren't staying contained at the uh, Nellis Air Force Base or whatever. Right. Um, so just going back then to some of the different groups, and I really like your uh, advice about sort of thinking about what people are interesting and following their stories. So yeah. we have spies and we have immigrants. And right. um, you also mentioned uh, women, the women yeah. uh, who were involved in um, Los Alamos and yeah. Manhattan Project. Could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, just uh, so some individual women, if you wanted to do like a biographical kind of NHD project, um, you could look at Floyd Agnes Lee, uh, who was a biologist who worked on the Manhattan Project, who was from Santa Clara, so she's a Pueblo uh, scientist. Uh, you could look at Frances Dunn, uh, who was an explosive supervisor. You could look at Jane Haydorn, uh, who started as a WAC in the Army um, and then worked for the laboratory. Uh, you could look at Jane Hall, uh, who was a physicist but also a leader um, and was an administrator and a really effective leader. Um, you could look at Maria Gappert Meyer, who was a physicist. You could look at Chen Cheng Wu, uh, who was a physicist. Um, there's a fantastic book um, called Their Day in the Sun uh, by Ruth Howes and Carolyn Hertzenberg, and they tried to write short biographical profiles of every woman that they could find information on who worked on the Manhattan Project, like wherever, not just in Los Alamos, but across the US and Canada. Um, and so it's like a really great resource um, to look at. Um, there's a website, which is a, a joint project of the Historical Society and the Atomic Heritage Foundation called manhattanprojectvoices.org. Um, and there's a subcategory, um, as you look at that, um, on women in science. So manhattanprojectvoices.org is just a collection of uh, oral history interviews. Um, a lot of them are videotapes. You can actually watch the, the interviews and read the transcripts. And there's a lot of women uh, who were there. Um, there are also a lot of other traditionally marginalized groups that you can you know, see um, different minority groups or other people that might not be the first people that you read about in history books about the Manhattan Project, but their stories are still on manhattanprojectvoices.org. Um, women in the Manhattan Project, I also really like the story of the Manhattan Project computers, um, because computers in the 1940s usually were women. Um, people maybe have um, seen the film that came out a couple of years ago about the NASA computers, which is a little bit later, but this is, you know, here in Los Alamos in the Manhattan Project, almost all the computations were done by women um, and women with calculators. And they didn't even have scientific calculators. It was just accounting calculators. Scientific calculators hadn't come out yet. They hadn't been developed yet. Um, so it's people um, like Mary Frankel um, who supervised the computers and worked as a computer herself. Later, she was a programmer on the ENIAC. Um, Wow. Uh, Mary Singu is also worth looking at. So she wasn't here in the Manhattan Project, but she was a physicist and a mathematician. And she was a key researcher on the Maniac computer in Los Alamos in the 1950s. Um, and they, women were a huge part of computing, um, both as computers and working on early supercomputers um, in Los Alamos. And in some ways it's because, like, so being a computer, being an actual human computer, um, wasn't prestigious. This was women's work because it was tedious detail-oriented stuff that men didn't want to do, but that gave these women a way to get their foot in the door. They had training in math and science. They had a passion for math and science, and they didn't have access as easily to careers in those fields in the 40s. So for some of these women, that Manhattan Project experience like got them on the path to the careers that they had for the rest of their lives working in, in computing. Um, again, Their Day in the Sun is a great place to look at that. Um, there's also a memoir that we publish um, called Tales of Los Alamos by Bernice Broad, and she worked as a computer. Um, 
she was not one of those who went on to a career in computing because she was um, uh, older than, well, the average age of people here in the Manhattan Project was like late 20s, early 30s. So she was not old while she was here, but she was older than average. Um, so she wasn't looking to start a new career. This was just something that she was doing while she was working here. But she has like first person accounts of what it was like to work as a computer in her memoir, um, Tales of Los Alamos. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And and I, I didn't realize that some of those women went on to work with ENIAC and some of yeah. these big computing projects is exciting. Yeah, I mean, um, computing, computing now, so. ManhattanProjectVoices.org. Yeah. Um, is that material available for History Day students to yeah. use? Yeah, absolutely. And it's really easy to search. Um, so if you go to the website, there's like a bunch of topic categories that you can click on. And there's also a search bar. So if you're looking for somebody in particular, they use keywords really well too. So if you just like wanted to write women or computers or whatever, um, you'll you'll see um, coming up at that search. It's a really great resource. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share some of these links out on this YouTube page, but also on our website. Awesome. And I did want to say if anybody has questions, um, please go ahead and use the chat feature on the YouTube page to send questions, or you can email them to me at um, historyday at nmhumanities.org. Um, but so I, I, I do want to take questions, but um, let's let's keep talking because this is exciting. <laughs> so you had a, a couple of things here on this list that you sent me. I don't know anything about. So the also mission yeah. and Joseph Rotblatt. Yeah. So while we're talking about people, so Joseph Rotblatt is a very interesting person who was here for the Manhattan Project because he was the only scientist who joined the Manhattan Project and then left for moral reasons. So like many people, Joseph Rotblatt joined the Manhattan Project to make sure that the Allies got an atomic bomb before the Nazis did. And Joseph Rotblatt uh, was from Poland, so he was especially interested. Um, and by... December of 1944, Rotblatt and others were fairly certain that Germany was not going to develop an atomic bomb before the end of the war. And so he said, I can't in good conscience continue working on this project. What I was trying to avoid, Nazis getting the atomic bomb isn't gonna happen. I don't want to continue working on this project. So he left um, the project and was the only one to leave for that reason um, over the course of the project. Um, he later went on to co-create the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, uh, which still exists as a group committed to the abolishment of nuclear weapons. And he shared a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for that work. Um, so he's, uh, there are lots of, you know, uh, Nobel laureates connected with the Manhattan Project, but he's the only one that I know of that was a Nobel Peace Prize winner as opposed to a science winner. Um, and if anybody is interested in learning more about Joseph Rotblatt, um, this is also a plug for our lecture series, the Historical Society. So um, our lecture on November 12th um, at 7 p.m. here um, in Fuller Lodge um, in Los Alamos will be by Jeffrey Boutwell. And he's someone who's worked for much of his career um, with Pugwash. And so he'll be speaking about Joseph Rotblatt and giving like an hour long um, talk uh, about Rotblatt and his career. Do you all um, capture those lectures in any way? I mean, yes, we do. Yes, thank you for asking. So that is also on our YouTube page. Oh, fantastic. Um, so I, I'll, I'll make sure to include a link to the YouTube page yeah, and so that people can catch up with that. Yeah, and I'm just, sure other good topics too, right? Yeah, all of our lectures are, are up on the, on the YouTube page. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I do think that being a dissenter is is sort of a fascinating approach to you know breaking barriers with nuclear science. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of students who did projects about um, Oppenheimer's mm -hmm. uh, dissent after the fact mm -hmm. and that sort of trajectory um, ending with the House on American Activities Committee right. issues and things like that. And, and um, that is a really interesting arc, but I've never mm -hmm. heard about Joseph Rotblatt and that he ended up um, becoming such a, a vocal and impassioned advocate that he got the Nobel Peace Prize. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he's a really interesting figure. Yeah. And so the way that Rotblatt knew that by December of 1944 that the um, Nazis were most likely not developing an atomic bomb is connected to that. The other thing that you'd mentioned, the ALSOS mission. Um, so the ALSOS mission was a 
mission to, uh, so it was, it was a small team of soldiers and scientists that were trying to figure out what, uh, where Germany's nuclear weapon project was and to make sure that those assets, like the scientific materials and the people involved didn't fall into Soviet hands as the allies were liberating France and pushing into Germany. So this is a small group of people that are literally like right behind the front lines, sometimes beyond <laughs> the front lines. Uh, so literally breaking barriers, like in this military sense, uh, trying to figure out um, where scientists in Germany were on their atomic bomb research. Um, it was uh, commanded by Colonel Boris Pasch uh, and their scientific advisor was um, Samuel Houtsmit. Um, it's a Dutch name that's G-O-U-D-S-M-I-T. Um, and so when they were late in 1944, they were in Strasbourg and they found laboratories that were German scientists had been working. Um, and so by late in 1944, they were pretty confident that the Nazis were not going to be anywhere near uh, a workable atomic bomb um, with it for, for a while. Um, and the way the war was going, probably not um, before the end of the war. Um, so that was what Rotblatt, I think, was basing his um, his information on. And there's, some, there's so um, Sam Houtsmit, who was the scientific advisor, uh, he wrote a book, a memoir after the fact, just called Alsos, um, which is really great. Um, and I just found doing a little bit of research for, for this uh, webinar that the Hoover Institution Library and Archives uh, YouTube page, they've got films of the Alsos mission, like um, silent like newsreels that they put together. Um, so you can see them in their Jeeps and it's not more than like three Jeeps for some of these, like that's how many people were involved. It's, it's a really like exciting espionage story of like these scientists trying to go and figure out what was going on. That is exciting. I was uh, talking with some students yesterday who are, um, they're wanting to do a project on rocket science yeah. and sort of looking at um, how that, that race um, to try and get our own V2 or to try yeah. and understand what the Germans were doing with the V2 yeah. um, impacted uh, Soviet and American rocketry during yeah. the Cold War period. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very specific aspect, but it yeah. sounds like there were a lot of these stories of sort of military science, yep. spies, scouts yeah. who were running around trying to find out more about this very carefully protected, very yes. hidden and obscured technology. Yeah. So, um, where the powers were, were also trying to protect their scientists and keep them from... Yes, um, right. And the, the Americans were trying to make sure like the Berlin Wall was not there yet, but they could sort of see it in their mind's eye. And the Americans were trying to make sure that the scientists, rocket scientists and atomic scientists were on their side and the Soviets were trying to do the same thing. I mean, to the point where the ALSOS mission took, I believe it was a dozen, it was around a dozen scientists that were working on the atomic research in Germany and took them to England and kept them- like, Physically took them. <laughs> physically, physically. Physically took them. <laughs> wow. A house in Britain and kept them there for months. Um, and those scientists were there um, through the end of the war. So they learned about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki while they were being kept in this, you know, English, you know, farmhouse. Um, it's called Farm Hall um, in, in Britain. And they thought that the news report was um, a false news report on the radio that their captors were trying to play to get them to tell their secrets. Like they were in disbelief immediate, like uh, their initial um, reaction was that they didn't believe that the allies had developed the atomic bomb because German physics was the best physics. Everybody knew that. So they thought that it was like a trick to try to get them to, you know, divulge their scientific secrets. But it, that was not. That Propaganda was not. and fake news, right? Right, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. So there's, there's a book um, called Farm Hall by Jeremy Bernstein that is um, actually annotated transcripts from that um, from that home where the, the scientists, the German scientists were kept in, in Britain. And that's fascinating reading also. It sounds like a great primary source. Yes, it is. Um, so uh, just speaking of primary sources, um, we've talked about a lot of different topics related to the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. um, 
do you, the Los Alamos History Museum, do you have these materials in your archives that can help students tell these stories? Yeah, so we have um, a lot of materials in our archives. We've got a lot of photographs. We have a lot of newspapers. Um, I think our strength for Manhattan Project, NHD projects, um, is if you're looking at a social history of what life was like here in Los Alamos, in this secret army base. Um, if you wanted to get a sense of that, I think our archives would be a really great place to look. Um, like the the um, having to pretend that you're going to a diff different destination, yeah. or having the letters redacted, or yeah. Yeah. having your communications monitored. Right, all of those, all of those kinds of stories. Wow. Um, and I, I saw on your website earlier that your archivist is starting to digitize some materials. Do you, oh, yeah. do you yeah. have uh, materials available on your website or how, how do well, students? Yet. Um, so I think the best resource, if students are interested um, in doing research on our archives, our archives are on an appointment basis. Um, and probably the easiest thing is to contact me um, and then I can talk with our archivists and connect that student directly with the archivist to set up a time that works um, for everybody. Um, so I'll, I'll give my contact info, I'll try to remember at the end of the webinar also, but for the moment, uh, also my email is educator at losalamoshistory.org. If you go to losalamoshistory.org and you look up my name, uh, my contact info is there too. And I'm. I'm happy to answer questions also that students have, whether it's connected to our archives or not. If it's just on this topic, I'm, I'm happy to, to help. Right, thank you. That's really generous. Um, and I know I mentioned it already, but as a judge, I think you have a pretty good perspective of what, what makes a strong NHD project, yeah. particularly, yeah. Um, and how students can really support. Um, it sounds like you've got this amazing, uh, knowledge about different kinds of primary sources. Um, and so I did wanna ask you a little bit about that. Um, so we've talked about a few different things. We've talked about some or oral history yep. that you have, some archival military footage, mm -hmm. um, per personal letters. Mm -hmm. um, and you said, um, you talked a little bit about transcripts or some other documents that are there military records involved or? I don't know if we have military records in our archives, um, but they there are, um, if you look, I can't tell you off the top of my head where um, those sorts was, of- Was that the, the army who was the- Yes, yeah, so, so the Manhattan Project was a uh, Army Corps of Engineers project. Okay, so yeah. the US Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah, and there'll be, um, political records uh, as well um, from Congress, especially after the fact, um, uh, once Congress is trying to debate if, okay, we have atomic weapons now, should those atomic weapons be in the hands of the military or in the hands of civilians? And this is a debate for a while um, after the war ends. Uh, and the country ends up deciding um, that it should be in the hands of civilians, and this is the Atomic Energy Commission, which is established, which, you know, it's sort of the precursor of today's Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's far from a foregone conclusion that uh, it's gonna be civilian control of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting little saga in history, also trying to decide who controls this? Because there were also Manhattan Project scientists who were arguing in that debate that it shouldn't belong to uh, civilians or to the military, but it should. this is not a secret. There needs to be some sort of world wow. organization set up that so that we can all control the use of this and make sure that no one you know, uses these in war. Again, this shouldn't be a national question. This should be an international question. Right. It's, it's, all, it's all on the table, really. And, 45, 46. So, so those debates are all part of public record. Yeah, and, yeah, and they even look in like the congressional record, <laughs> newspapers at the time to see you know people writing um, articles about that, people writing letters to the editor. Um, you, you and I have talked a lot about some of the secrecy around the Manhattan Project and the development of the nuclear bombs, but. Um, is is this material still classified? I mean, can kids even find it? So 
some of it. I know that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> some of it is, um, but at this point, most um, uh, there. I think what you're more likely to see is uh, sources that have been redacted. Um, so there'll be like some pages that are missing, and there'll be some like you know detailed figures that have been blacked out. Um, but that's going to be really technical information for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and a great place to go to get some of those sorts of primary sources and to get some good secondary analysis um, is the restricted data blog, um, which historian Alex Wellerstein runs. Uh, so he does blog posts both a look at, um, you know, as a historian creating the secondary source sort of and analyzing different things that have to do with the Manhattan Project or with atomic weapons. But also on his blog, he's got links to a bunch of declassified sources that he's scanned and put up as PDFs that are available for people to, to look at. So it's, it's a really cool resource. That sounds really fun. Yeah. Just go poke around in the secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for a lot of them, he's got his own sort of annotated takes on, uh, you know, in his blog posts. So you can get both the primary source and one historian's take on it. Um, so you can help put it into context a little bit if it's the first time that you're running across this as an NHD student. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, because we've talked about, we've talked a lot about sort of the, um, military or offensive aspect of nuclear science. Can we talk a little bit about, um, other aspects of nuclear science yeah. and, and how some barriers got broken, um, in different, in different areas besides just militarily? Yeah. Yeah. Since, um, since that's your specialty. <laughs> <laughs> well, so one thing that is, connected to the Manhattan Project, but not connected to um, Los Alamos was the Chicago pile. Right? So that's the first man-made self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction um, in December of 1942. And that was um, Enrico Fermi and his team at the University of Chicago did that. It was part of the Manhattan Project, but demonstrating that you could have a nuclear chain reaction in laboratory conditions uh, gave them reason to think that you could build both nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants. So it's sort of a basis for all of that research. Um, and going back to the secrecy we've been talking about, that research wasn't announced. It wasn't in scientific journals um, at the time. That was a secret project. So even though it was the first, that team didn't know for certain that they were the first because it was possible that another country was doing their own secret research that hadn't been published in, in scientific journals. Um, and again, there were women involved with that project. There were refugees involved with that project. So it's another way in if you're wanting to, to do like those sorts of barriers being broken, both the scientific barriers and also the sort of barriers to entry to careers in science. Um, we've got uh, a piece of graphite from that pile on display in the museum, um, which could be a fun primary source to come and look yeah. at. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say also that another place to go look if you're looking for artifacts um, uh, uh, coming out of either nuclear bomb development or nuclear science, they have a ton over at the National Nuclear Museum in Albuquerque. Yeah, absolutely. And the lady told me we have more warheads than anyone, so you can go. <laughs> yeah, and, and those, a lot of those you can take very good photos of um, because some of them, you know, are uh, just behind rope rather than behind glass, so you can get really good pictures. A lot of them aren't even behind rope. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, the Bradbury Science Museum here in Los Alamos has some really oh, great, great. Um, artifacts on display as well. Um, and those those count as primary sources. Like even if that's just background research, even if you're doing, um, you know, an essay, something that doesn't have a visual component to it, seeing actual objects mm -hmm. and seeing how big they are in comparison to a human, you have some idea of what it was like to work with this. Just knowing, having a sense of their physicality, I think, can be a really valuable, like, primary source um, for for NHD projects. At the Nuclear Museum, they have, um, I don't know whether it's a replica or whether it was an extra casing from Fat Boy, mm. um, and along with a crane that they used. I mean, obviously not the crane that they used to drop Fat Boy, but the same structure. Okay. So you can really get a sense of yeah. how, um, like you and I were talking about, how they had engineered this, I mean, almost uh, this experiment to see yeah. whether they were gonna be able to break that barrier between the cores and start the little fission reaction without yeah. 
yeah. something else catastrophic happening. But when you look at it, it's like some kind of weird Victorian steampunk <laughs> contraption. I mean, it doesn't look like modern science. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, it, but it was, yeah. But it was. And that's one of the reasons that it's really valuable to go and look at these actual objects, because then you, you get a sense of like what, what it was like. So. And I guess it's 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 a little bit past the time uh, when it is open to the public, but you know, there's also the Trinity side, of course, where you can sort of go and get a sense of um, <clears throat> that first that first breaking the, right. the nuclear bomb barrier. Right. Um, so uh, we just have a few minutes left. I, I still want to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's um, let's talk real quickly about nuclear medicine. Sure. Um, so what one one place to start in that is looking at the Curies. Uh, I know that Marie Curie can be a popular um, NHD project, but looking at her involvement um, with the beginnings of radium therapy um, is maybe less common uh, because she got so she was the only person to get two Nobel prizes in different scientific fields. Only person, not only woman, only person. Uh, and, but those prizes were in physics and chemistry, um, but she did work um, with radium therapy as well. Um, and th there were, it, it would be, um, that's an interesting project to look at people using x-rays as medicine. This is mm -hmm. before um, radioactivity was being used. So using x-rays, both the way that we think of x-rays today as like a diagnostic tool, but also using it as a therapy, exposing people to uh -huh. x-rays. Um, and it's related to um, like um, radiation medicine today that people, you know, still use radiation um, to treat cancers and other things. And it's very controlled and it's very directed and it can be very effective. Um, and the, the early days of that, at the uh, end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s, there's, there's a lot <laughs> of research going on trying to figure out um, what this does. You don't know the long-term effects until time has gone on, uh, and it's 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 very interesting. Um, there were um, a lot of people who were doing research in um, X-rays, in particular, a lot of researchers um, who died because they got the most exposure to X-rays. Their patients would come in and they get their one treatment or however many treatments, but the, the person who's running the machine is getting all of this mm -hmm. because they weren't. They didn't know yet to use the sort of shielding that we know to use um, with x-rays. And so there was an uh, 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 understanding among scientists and I think among um, just the public as well that they were referred to as martyrs to science, like breaking this barrier of research to the point of martyrdom and using that language. Um, and that's, that's another interesting sort of barrier. <laughs> it is. It like, is. Doing research to that point where your own personal safety is, is sort of disregarded. Well, and I think uh, so, some of those stories might come come out of uh, the Manhattan Project or some of those nuclear scientists too. I mm -hmm. mean, that, um, you know, people may have been aware to some degree of the dangers involved, but they were still, I mean, one of the takeaways I always have from reading about the scientists involved in the Manhattan Project is how in love with the science and the discovery and the challenge they were. I mean, it was, um, they were um, enchanted yeah. with the possibility of creating all these new frontiers. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a little risk would seem like a price well right. paid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that was, you know, going back to Marie Curie, that was, she was happy to take that risk too. And that, that um, you know, ultimately was um, what, what led to her death was radiation poisoning. Um, and her, her family is, is involved in research as well. Her, uh, her peers, uh, eldest daughter, Irene, uh, was a scientist and she married a scientist. So Irene and Frédéric Julio Curie worked together the way that oh. Marie and Pierre Curie worked together as collaborators, publishing scientific papers together, making sure that both people got caught like credit in the oh. that it wasn't just the man. And they were also breaking barriers politically, Irene and Frédéric. Um, they were both very politically active. Irene um, was a very committed feminist. 
Um, she was not in Paris during the occupation. Um, so she and their children were uh, in Switzerland, I think. Um, but Frederic was in Paris, in occupied Paris, and um, was committed to helping the resistance. He provided Molotov cocktails to the resistance out of his chemistry laboratory. Um, so like those are also breaking barriers. <laughs> you know, people doing like groundbreaking research. Um, Irene and Frederic Joliot Curie shared a Nobel Prize, um, but they're also doing all this political work. And it's looking at scientists as people that like there's that for a lot of scientists that could be an all consuming passion, working on that science, that passion that you were talking about. But they are people too and they they have other interests and for some that's that's breaking political barriers to the point of you know defying nazis by building a Molotov cocktail right. or or defying the americans by stepping aside from the project or yeah. right. um, sharing the technology with a competing superpower right. well, superpower <laughs> I'd, I'd love to to mention um lisa meitner also because she broke a barrier by not participating in the Manhattan Project. You could almost make the argument. So Lisa Meitner, um, with uh, her nephew Otto Frisch, with Otto Hahn, and with Fritz Strassmann, discovered nuclear fission. This is the splitting of the atom that makes mm. atomic weapons and atomic energy possible. Um, she, was, she was working in Berlin. She was from Austria. Um, by the time the Manhattan Project was getting started, she was a refugee in Sweden. And since she was, you know, one of these four people that discovered fission, the Manhattan Project came to her and said, would you like to come in to America, work on the Manhattan Project? And she refused. She didn't want to work on weapons. And so she, there, were, there were other people who were offered to, you know, come and work on the Manhattan Project. We can't tell you what it's about, but it has to do with, you know, your specialty. And you could sort of put the dots together and be like, no, I don't want to work on weapons. But she's probably the most well known of those scientists who said, no, I, I, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna start on that. Wow. She's, wow. she's a really interesting, sorry, I mean, she, she broke barriers in being um, the second woman to earn her PhD um, from the University of Vienna. Um, she was um, uh, the first woman in Germany to become a full professor of physics um, when she did that in 1926. Um, she has an element named after her, mitnerium. So wow. she breaks all kinds of barriers in science as well. That, that would be a really interesting research topic. Yeah. Um, so just, just to wrap up, can we talk real quickly? We've talked about sort of two different kinds of histories that students can tell around um, nuclear science. So the one is where the sort of the social history. Right. Really, um, and the other one is sort of a scientific history. And right. um, what should students keep in mind if they're um, doing uh say a more scientific history so if they said okay well we really want to get into um some of the science that earned marie curie her her nobels right. in physics and chemistry right um how is that project going to look a little bit different than one that's more like the social history of women breaking gender barriers in the right. sciences? yeah um i think even if you are looking at uh, sort of a more technical and more scientifically based um, project, you still need to demonstrate to the judges why this is important. Like, why did it matter that this discovery was made, that this barrier was broken? What was it that um, the Nobel Prize uh, group thought uh, that Marie Curie deserved to the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry? What was the, what was the outcome of that? Um, and what was the significance of, of breaking that barrier? Um, because that, that, that just focusing on that and making that argument around what the significance of them, that could be a scientific significance that based on the discovery of radium, that means that we know more about radioactivity. That means that these other scientific discoveries can happen. So it doesn't have to be necessarily um, social outcomes based off of that, but that it had some meaning, that that, that scientific research wasn't done in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if you are if you are a, a, a NHD student who's interested in this sort of more technical um, science aspect, don't worry. I think that uh, you haven't taken college uh, <laughs> physics classes or you haven't taken your quantum mechanics or whatever it is that you need to know. Um, 
you can, there are sources out there that can help you to understand what the significance of it is. So you don't have to be able to explain all of the variables in this equation or how you derive this equation from that equation. Knowing the significance of that and what it meant um, for that scientist to come up with that discovery, what avenues of research it opened up, I think you can understand even without having taken any of your, your college science classes yet because you aren't, you aren't there yet. Um, so I wouldn't, if that's where you're interested, I think don't let that scare you. I think that, that you can still engage with that history. I think that's really good advice. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm sorry to say we're, we're actually out of time for the day. This is just flown by talking with you and um, I'm, I'm going to, put all these links up um, yeah. under the YouTube description and I'll include your email um, so people can contact um, contact you and contact the Los Alamos History Museum if they want to come in and do some research yeah. or um, work with you all. Um, so I, I'm going to also include some of the book titles that you mentioned. Great. But if after the fact you come and you say, well, but I also talked about this, I'll, I'll add it in. So. Oh. We're, we we, we want to give people as many resources as they can to tell um, some of these different kinds of stories around, um, you know, one of the most significant and impactful um, historical periods in New Mexico history. Right. You know, sort of impacted the whole world. Yeah. I mean, New Mexico yeah. doesn't always impact the whole world, like um, the way that our nuclear scientists have done. So. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. I really appreciate you being here. And uh, I just wanted to say in another two weeks, we're gonna be doing our final webinar. Um, let me see when is it, that is gonna be. Um, it's gonna be November 12th at 4 p.m. And um, we're gonna be taking a look at the uh, online atlas of historic New Mexico maps and how students can use um, the primary source resources available in the Atlas as part of their New Mexico history projects. So uh, maybe not so so much the modern science. Amy, Amy's got your back with there, but I'll help you with the historic maps. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.